Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Pete Tatey from Pratt & Whitney. Uh, I would like to welcome you to today's Aero Engine Supplier Quality Webinar, uh, sponsored by the Process Control Methods Subject Matter Interest Group. Let's put my video on here. Uh, again, this is our, uh, this is now our sixth webinar in a series that started back in December. Today is all about process control assessment. We call it the one hour process control assessment. And the theme of today's webinar is that it does not take multiple, multiple days or, you know, even um, a very lengthy piece of time in order to assess whether or not a supplier has an adequate process control system. And with the emphasis today on AS 13,100 and chapters B and C, we felt it was important to uh, uh, share with you some best practices around assessing one's process control system. So the next slide, please. Today, uh, speakers will be myself, Pete Tatey, a fellow of quality engineering at Pratt & Whitney. And I'd like to introduce to you one of our newer members, Ricardo Benulis, Dr. Ricardo Benulis from Rolls-Royce out in Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, Ricardo is going to be assisting myself today in providing this important presentation. I want to also recognize on the call our fellow SMIG team members, Andrew Stout from Pratt Whitney Canada, Grant Braun from ECC, and Rudy Braunier from our MTU uh, partner. So, um, with that said, I'd like to now turn it over to Ricardo, who's going to go over with you the next series of slides. Ricardo? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pete. Uh, yes, my name is Ricardo Bañuelas. I work in Rolls Royce as a head of um, continuous improvement and quality in North America. I've been in the company for around 18 years, half the time in the UK, uh, but now I'm based in Indianapolis. So I also co author of the uh, RM30000 and uh, I'm also Master Black Bell. So, uh, next slide, please, Becky. Um, so we're going to go today, uh, we have 60 minutes planned for this webinar. So this is how it's going to be divided, right? So we're going to start with a video introduction about how process control fits with uh, chapter B and chapter C, a fast review of the BFMEs and control plan uh, and what ten availability we have. But the bulk of the uh, webinar will be on the one hour process control assessment that Pete is going to take us through. And then towards the end, I'm gonna take you through uh, some red flags, right? So when you're doing the assessment, what are the uh, the red flags that you might look like? Uh, hey, let's let's put a bit more focus on this, or, or, or let's try to understand this a bit more, right? So we're gonna go through that uh, towards the end of uh, the webinar today. Next. So this webinar has other one that you've probably been um, part of. Uh, we're recording this webinar and we will send you the video link at the end of the webinar. So you can access that um, whenever you can, right? Um, all the webinars are there recorded, so you, you can access them whenever you, you feel free to, to do that. Um, we will take any questions during the webinar just in the chat. If you have any questions, just type your question and we're going to be reading some of the questions. Um, and we will have a, a, a time at the end of the, uh, of the webinar to go through any question that you might have as well. So, uh, you're going to be mute. So you won't try to talk. You're going to be able to do that right now. So please use the, uh, the, the, the chat function to do that instead. Next. So the, the process control methods as the, uh, as the RM 3006. So the main purpose of this, just as a refresher of what is the main purpose of this um, of this uh, uh, reference manual, is to raise the overall capability of their space uh, air engine supply chain. 
So we're looking here for standardizing the process control requirements across all of our suppliers and build the requirements and the defect, defect prevention quality tools, right? So this this reference manual and this this is this part of the standard uh, is also linked and support the AS9145, uh, all the requirements for APQ and PPAP. So as you know, a part of the APQP is process control. So this this standard support that, as well as the AS9103 on variation management for key characteristics. So so this this is a good reference man manual that is is referred on those standards too. Uh, this manual, as you might know, and the other ones, uh, it was developed by a dedicated team of the AGSQ practitioners, uh, so you matter experts, and we put all this together. Um, so it's, it's done, it's done by the team. Next. Um, so the 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 group that put this standard together is uh Peter and I are part of this and we have other members uh linking today. You can ask questions as well to them, other 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 companies. Um but the main the main purpose of this group, of the Sawyer Matter group, is to to promote the effective deployment of the reference manual using the community of practice, right? Um this community of practice is open to everyone that has interest to that. Uh, I'm going to explain a bit more how you can join the community of practice, uh, but we do a bunch of things. So we we do these webinars, pretty active team in terms of webinar. So as Pete say, when the sixth one of this year, and we're planning to do more uh, on the rest of the uh, of the year. Uh, and Pete's going to take us through what are going to be the next topics. But if you want to know more about one particular topic, just let us know, and we will and we will develop something that is uh, that you're interested uh, on. We can do that. We also share training materials with our conference and publish paper together. So it's a very active, very active team. Next. So the team, uh, you can see some of the people that are from the team. Uh, Pete is our leader. Uh, Andrew, who is also here, uh, is the co-leader. Um, I just joined the team, but I was very happy to join the team because it's a very active team, uh, trying to do a lot of, um, uh, of help and coaching people and, and, and making sure that, uh, the process control is, 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 is more mature in the supply chain. So we have people from Brad and Whitney, GKN, GKN, uh, PCC, MTU, Rolls Royce and GE and this group, right? Um, and you will see at the end what webinar we're planning to do in the future. Uh, next, um, on the press control methods, the community of practice, uh, you can go to the, um, to the web page to, to access to the reference manual, which is free and all the supported templates are free too as well. Uh, we meet monthly and we, we update templates and, and share best practice based on your feedback. So please, uh, use the feedback. You can, you can contact us. Uh, using the web page, but also through LinkedIn. So if you type uh, there the community of practice, you will find us, and and you can ask questions that we that we can see uh, in in LinkedIn, and, and we'll try to answer your questions uh, as soon as possible. But yeah, give us more feedback. So crew members is around two hundred people in this in this call right now. We are close to two hundred people as well. So so welcome everyone, and just let us know how we can. What else we can do for you? Um, next, I think it's over to you, Pete. Um, oh, thank you so much, Ricardo. Um, so, folks, now we're going to start digging into what we're calling a one hour process control assessment. It really doesn't take a lot of time to understand whether or not someone has a decent process control system in place. And again, the emphasis in AS 13,100 chapter B is on process control. So we're going to talk about the key components of that as we go through the fundamentals required to be in place, a linkage to the spec, which is 13,100, both chapters B and C. How do we assess a process control system? Does it have to take a long time? But 
there are key questions to be aware of that we can ask, and we've got them here with some guidance and what to look for, who to talk to. If you had an hour dedicated for this effort, how would we utilize that hour? Next slide, please. So why this webinar? The SMIG team thought this would be a very good thing to do in order because of the emphasis now as AS13100 went into effect this past January 1st, the timing for this was, was relevant and right. So we wanna provide a brief guideline that you could utilize uh, in a supplier's process control system to ensure you're meeting chapters B and C. It's not about boiling the ocean, get right to the point and complete it quickly. Um, it'll allow us to understand if a supplier is working uh, to implement process control for, for their good, not to be just compliant to the customer, that's not a strong enough reason to drive process control. It should be for, for, for the supplier's benefit. And so that's what we're really looking for. Is it being done to benefit the supplier, the producer? And what do we do if the implementation isn't where we would like it to be? Next slide, please. So we mentioned already chapter B, which focuses on the advanced product quality planning and production part approval process. That's AS9145. Chapter B in AS13100 provides supplementary requirements. The things that we in the aero engine OEM world feel are very important for our supply chain, including our own internal sites to be working to. So AS9145 is all revolves around new product introduction, product and design changes, when we have a transition in a source and when we come up with major quality issues. So again, you know, on the right side of this slide, and we show a little cartoon of AS13100 in the middle here, but we wanna look that AS13100 is being required, you know, by the OEM on the purchase order and then we define, it, it defines the submission requirements for PPAP as well. You know, do we submit, you know, evidence to the customer, submitting PPAP evidence to the customer in, in terms of retaining documentation or witness at a supplier? Those are the levels of PPAP called out, but it all drives elements of process control. So what evidence should we be looking for if we were to do an assessment? That'll help determine whether or not PPAP as a whole, at least the process control portion is healthy. The next slide, please. So I love this diagram. You know, this is uh, from the AESQ that you can get on the website a really nice poster of this, but the video is what's most important because it talks about the interactions of the different reference manuals. And this assessment, this short assessment, drives that interaction between a, you know, RM13004, which gets into failure mode effects analysis from a design and process standpoint, process flow diagrams, control plans, and then how that interacts with process control and process control methods defined in RM13006. Also, when issues do arise that require an investigation, like a customer escape, how we take RM13000 and we interact back to the PFMEA documentation that may need to be updated. And along with all of that, a focus on measurement system quality with RM13003. 
So if you haven't had a chance to see that short four minute video, it's well worth it. And it's on the front end of the AESQ website. Uh, I would highly recommend it because it really describes how these reference manuals interact. And that's our focus today is on the process control piece of this, of this diagram. Next slide, please. So building off of that, the reference manuals are there for all of us, not just the, uh, you know, the suppliers, but even the OEMs. We use these reference manuals now in our standard work for conducting a PFMEA or a design FMEA. We're driving process control methods on control plans. It's all built into our standard work today at Pratt. And as I know, the other uh, member OEM companies have done the same. So we pull these reference manuals together over a period of several years and provide them for free. And they're loaded with case studies on how to implement the tools we're driving in chapters B and C. So that way it's clearly understood what the expectations are and how to implement those tools properly. Um, and again, as Ricardo mentioned, that's what the subject matter interest groups are all about, is ensuring the uh, continuing improvement of these reference manuals, as well as providing training webinars such as this. Next slide, please. So, what in 13,006, one of the first questions that we'll see revolves around, do you have someone or if you were assessing a supplier, do you have one or two people who are well versed in process control methods? There's a training syllabus in RM 13006. And it's not that we look that every single line item can be objectively shown, but the spirit of it, you have someone that's a green belt or a Six Sigma black belt or certified quality engineer someone who's received formalized training in these methods, going back to that interaction diagram prior, you know, any one of those types of certifications gets a person that gets trained in basically most of what's in the reference manuals. And so we're showing a partial syllabus here. It's uh, to, show you know the various focus areas the importance of process control uh how we plan for it the selection of control methods going about data collection strategies how we set up data collection error proofing non-statistical methods which was a subject of a prior webinar so again do we have folks who are versed well in the training syllabus here in RM 13006. That's important in order to be able to have someone who can lead and help train folks within a company. Next slide, please. So the focus areas coming out of table eight, which is uh, uh, right out of uh, uh, AS 9145 uh, and 13,100 shows this table the key elements of APQP and PPAP. So the arrows primarily point to those elements that are subject of the short one hour process control assessment. And that's what we'll start digging into. Then these are all supported by the gold books, the various reference manuals. So process flow diagrams, PFMEA, key characteristics, control plans, MSA studies, capability studies. This is what we're going to be focusing on in terms of the questions coming up. And I believe that begins on the next slide. Uh, so we're going to prepare for the assessment. We have this, and I, again, we say one hour. Well, what if it takes one hour and 15 minutes? Big deal. What if it's two hours? Okay. It's still not that much time, but the idea is it doesn't have to take several days to assess one's process control system. So how would we prepare? Number one, 
pull a PPAP part number and with a list of key characteristic features defined by the customer, or they may be self-selected by the supplier or both. Have the supplier pull out a copy of their flow diagram, their PFMEA and their control plan. That would be part of the evidence we would want to go over in the assessment. The operator work instructions, we would want to review those to ensure any key characteristics are identified on those instructions. And the operator knows exactly what to do when triggered by a key characteristic symbol on their work instructions. What does that mean to them? What actions will that drive? In terms of data collection and monitoring, and uh, and we'll get more about where that actually is happening. Um, try to schedule your visit on a day that the supplier would be running those particular parts, because you're going to want to go out and witness some key operations, and see exactly process control and how it's being done and implemented, where the transformation of the product is happening. So we wanna schedule at least an hour on the agenda for whatever you're going in there for and, uh, and, and reserve that time for a quick process control assessment. Now I'll just let you know, I've trained all our <clears throat> folks in our audit group and our squares in this particular package. And this is what they're using now when they go out to actually assess and get that confidence level that the producers that they're responsible for have a process control system that meets AS 13,100 chapter B. So the next slide, please. And the reference manual interactions cannot emphasize this enough. We look at 13,004, where PFMEAs and flow diagrams and control plans come from, how that leads into 13,006, where we look at control methods and properly written control plans, reaction plans, the last column. We wanna make sure the reaction plans are being written properly and that they align with the control methods being selected. 13,010 is on human factors. And of course, that has an interaction with process control methods when in fact an investigation occurs that drives an 8D investigation. We look at sources of or causes of escapes that could be human factor related that may drive newer controls to be added to the process. And so again, these four really have a heavy interaction with each other. One document that's actually missing that should be on here is 13,003, measurement systems analysis. But uh, again, this is what we're gonna look at now. Next slide. So bottom line, what should we look for? You have an hour. What am I gonna look for to assess a process control system? So, and we'll see the questions following this slide. Flow diagrams with key characteristics identified, where they're produced, where they're inspected. PFMEA with key characteristics accounted for, control plans also accounting for key characteristics and other high risk areas uncovered in the PFMEA. It's not always just key characteristics uh, that are part of the process control system. Gauge capability studies, the use of non-statistical or mistake proofing devices, control charts at the point of manufacture, uh, not just operations later after the transformation's done where we collect data on a CMM and then we create the control chart. That's reporting the news. That's not process control. It is a process control subject matter expert on staff. That's a big deal. 
evidence that there's process control training for operators and engineers and the use of process control data by the engineering department to help set realistic and, and producible tolerances. Those are things we would look for. Now, can all that get done in an hour? It, it, it could be a little bit tight, I'll admit that, but most of it can be. And these are things that I would look for if I were going in. Next slide. Question number one, is the supplier familiar with RM 13,004, 13,006, and 13,003? We talked a bit about this already. Is there anyone on staff that is familiar? Anyone that may have like a Six Sigma certification or an ASQ certified quality engineering certification? Um, again, those are signs that we have people that understand what's going on with these gold books and how they should be implemented. It's not the end all. There's nothing beats hands on experience. Uh, <clears throat> but again, having that person on the staff to help drive the implementation and training and even the, the standard work is a huge benefit. Question number two I would ask our operator work instructions identified with key characteristic features on them. And so we would want to look for that on that work instruction to see if somehow there is an indicator, some key characteristic symbol that triggers the operator and drives them to ensure they've got some form of SPC control chart, data collection and monitoring device at their disposal. Maybe they it, it drives them to pull up a real-time SPC program, or they may be utilizing a manual chart. Uh, I've seen it, it's still, those are still used today. The important thing is, is it, is the operator know what to do? And is it being done at the transformation operation, if at all possible? Next slide, please. So number three, Question three, how does the operator collect the SPC data? This is where I would go out to the Gemba. I'd want to see it happening. Let's take a walk out there and let's talk to the operator. Okay, I see on your work instruction, it asks for, you know, it indicates a key characteristic. What's the control system for that? What, what type of data collection do, do you have to do? What's the monitoring of that like? So. I'm looking for an example of a heart rate monitor. And what happens if that monitor starts trending in the wrong direction or has an erratic pattern? So Western electric rules apply with the control chart. I'm looking for these two down in here, a control chart and Western electric rule knowledge by the operator. They understand when they need to stop get help, take action, because that's what a control method does. It alerts the user when they've entered into an error state and allows them time to take the right action to get out of that error state to avoid a failure mode altogether. So um, this is just an example on the left. Um, you know, of, a, of, a, of an old gauge talker system from many, many years ago. That's Pete on the right there, back when I had a nice head of hair. But I was a young engineer at the time getting involved with automated SPC that we were just learning about back in 1989. That's how long, far back that picture goes. Uh, and I was fascinated at that time with the, you know, the advance in technology, getting away from paper charts and re-entering data into Lotus 1, 2, 3. <laughs> and so uh, that was quite a time as the advances in computer technology were coming on to us like a firestorm. Next slide, please. Question four, has a gauge capability study been done? It's required for key characteristics in AS 13,100. So we look at the results. 
well, what are the results like? What, some customers may require no more than 20% of tolerance being consumed by the measurement system variation, which includes a combination of the gauge or the repeatability and the operator to operator, inspector to inspector variation, which we call the reproducibility. Um, and depending on the type of feature, it could be up to 30% allowance. Again, check the spec to be sure. Um, I know on our key characteristics, key product characteristics, we require no more than 20%, you know, to be consumed by the measurement system. Um, see if the supplier practices guard banding that's called out in RM 13,003. If the event occurs where they're exceeding what the AS 13,100 allowance is, what? type of action are you taking if your measurement system studies prove that the measurement system needs improvement? You know, are, are we calibrating the methods between operators, working to a get better, more repeatable gauging? You know, what actions are we taking with that study? Doesn't take a long time to dig into that one. Number five, what SPC and MSA training do your operators and engineers get? Who provides it? Again, that goes back to question number one. You know, do we have someone on staff who's capable of delivering that kind of training? Or are you getting it from, you know, AESQ? Are you getting it from a local community college or university? You know, one way or the other, how are the people who need to understand how to implement these things getting that knowledge? And that's what this is all about, this particular question. So we can spend a little bit of time on that. Again, that doesn't take a long time to get to the answer. Next slide, please. Number six, how do you handle when CPKs or the process capability index you're using is not to the satisfactory level. CPK of 1.33 is what we typically strive for. That's what's called out in the spec. But what happens when it's like less than one, which technically is incapable, right? That means we have more, you know, if, if I was trying to park my car into my garage, it would technically mean that my car is either too wide for the garage or it's off center to the point where I might hit a wall if I go to go into the garage. So either way, I've got to take some action to avoid that collision. And so what examples can we see where we're doing something with the capability data? How do we utilize it? Is that something that we can see being formally done as part of a you know, like a manufacturing corrective action board with engineering. Um, uh, how do we go about, you know, prioritizing what incapable processes need improvement? So we would look, you know, for evidence of that. Is there some form of monthly quality improvement meeting? If no meeting exists, then this would be a sign that the process control is for compliance purposes only. Uh, number seven, does the supplier self-select their own key characteristics based on risks identified in the PFMEA? This is a very, very weak area. Uh, I hate to say it, but it is. We don't see a lot of folks self-selecting their own key characteristics, not from a design or product standpoint, but more from a process risk reduction standpoint. There are many cases where we could have self-selected um, process key characteristics, not just the design key characteristics a customer may flow down. This will tell a lot about the commitment to process control and the true understanding of it. So if we see a lack of self-selection, then they're probably in it for compliance only. That's a sign, that's a red flag. Number eight, does the supplier 
the producer. And again, when I say supplier, I'm talking not only about our external suppliers, I'm talking about our own internal areas. We apply these questions internally as well. I want to emphasize that point. And I, and I speak on behalf of the other AESQ member companies. They, they take very serious internal strides to implement these tools as we drive them externally as well. Does the supplier highlight processes that are incapable and in what is being done about it in the factory where the operators who collect and monitor their process see what's going on? Is it visible to them so they know something's being done with the data? They know it's not just a waste of time. And so that's important part of the you know, that the operator sees that there's action being done with it. They'll buy into it more now. We start building that culture, that, you know, statistical thinking culture, that process control culture that we desperately need to have in our industry. Very, very important. And are, is there anything posted where it's visible and, you know, the, the low CPK of the month? Um, what are the top or worst three CPKs we're going after? And here are the actions we're working on. Next slide. And number nine, uh, describe how you would handle uh, when the customer defines key characteristics, but they're being produced by one of, a, by a supplier's sub tier. How do they flow down those requirements? Um, that's a, it's a requirement to flow down AS 13100 uh, to, to a sub tier and ensure that the process control requirements are along with 13100 are flowed down. So this may not be applicable always at the present time, this question. You know, we might be walking into a, a supplier that doesn't have any flow down and they're making the product themselves. But when it comes time where they're subcontracting that out and there are key characteristics on it, flow down from an OEM or self-selected by the first tier, then we have to ensure that process control requirements are being flowed down through AS 13,100. So the first tier would contract out the part manufacturing does a vendor assist that involves a key characteristic? That could happen too. It could be contracting out one or two operations, not the whole part. But if it has key characteristics on it, then the control system has to be uh, uh, assessed, and it ha we have to make sure it's uh, you know supported by the flow down of the spec. Very very important in that case. Again, that may not apply everywhere. But uh, uh, that's something that we see more often now because uh, we do see a lot of first tiers contracting out parts with second tiers. So we just gotta be careful of that. And next slide, please. So following the assessment, we wanna point, and again, this is not an audit. This is an assessment. So at the very end, we talk about what we saw, the good and the things that can be improved. But we always want to point out the good. And, um, and again, this is not an audit, but following it, we want to point the, you know, to the AESQ website, the fact that some of uh, the training that the supplier could use could also be on the website in, in the way of a past webinar. And so go to the AESQ past events website, access the webinar videos and material. That's all free. That's always good. Uh, we might want to refer them to the upcoming events so they can see what training webinars are forthcoming. I can tell you this, this coming Wednesday, there's a dandy coming up. It's uh, FMEA on human factors. I plan on taking that one myself. That's this Wednesday on uh, May 18th. Oh no, I'm sorry, Thursday, May 18th. So uh, 
again, go to that um, uh, upcoming events page to look for what's forthcoming. And then uh, refer to the suppliers to the AESQ website for the free reference manuals under the supplemental materials page. Again, not only the manuals, but templates, a lot of good templates. And there's a lot more that we're going to be putting on in the future. Uh, that's something we're talking about right now. We're trying to pull the best templates that the OEMs may have and, um, and then make those available for free to the supplier. They could be control chart templates, Pareto chart templates, 5Y uh, fishbone diagram templates, things like that. Next slide, please. I believe at this point, I now turn it back over to my associate and fellow team member, Ricardo. Thank you, Pete. Um, so in next um, 10 minutes, I'm gonna take you to some of the red flags to look for. Um, based on what uh, Pete just took us through, right? So the red flags are points where uh, we might need to try to understand a bit more uh, what is happening uh, to make some recommendations to, to, to improve, right? So next. So I'm gonna take you through some red flags uh, about process control, but as you know, process control is linked to uh, process flow diagrams, PFMEA, MSA. So. I'm going to cover some of those red flags on those is standard because everything is linked, right? So if you don't have a good process flow and with PFMA and MSA, you might be controlling something that is not as important as should be, right? So this is why we need to look at uh, those standards as well, right? So for process flow diagrams, right? It's a couple of things that we need to look at uh, as a potential red flags. It's just, it's just a sample, right? It's, it's, it can be other things. We're going to cover a couple of things here. So, one of the things you might look is when you, because your process flow diagram and that doesn't align to the, to the router or the traveler or the job order, right? Obviously, it's a red flag, right? It should be, it should be uh, what is including the process flow. It should be in your instructions in the router or traveler. That's a, that's a, that's an obvious one if you like. The the other one is is really interesting, right? In some cases. Uh, the supplier has an authorized way to uh, to manufacture a part that it, it can follow different paths or different workstation. So the same operation can be performed at a different workstation or, or different machines and so on. So it's important to look that uh, you have a process control for each of the approved uh, ways of manufacturing. Uh, if you are looking at that the, upper, the supplier only has one uh, process control for the, the main one, but not the others, you might be uh, making some assumptions that is, uh, need to be better on the process control aspect for everything, right? So the, the other aspect on the PFMEA is, is, is a few things that we need to look in here. Uh, and you have taken uh, some of the training, you, 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 you might know these things, uh, but it's worth repeating this a little bit. So, obvious one, if you have PFMEA document that is dated, uh, even when the changes in the process have, have occurred. So, PFMEA is and most of these tools are live documents, so it needs to reflect what actually happens, right? It, it, it should be exactly what is happening should be reflected in there, right? So, so look for that. The other two are very, very similar, right? There are two points in here. Sometimes uh, suppliers put a, a, a failure modes because they are combined into one line. So it's difficult to know what control method you have depending on the codes. So it's a better practice to divide every code into one row if you like and put what process control method you have on those. So it's very clear uh, for each code what control method do you have? So making sure that those are separate and also that they're aligned correctly in your PFMEA. So most of the uh, aero engine manufacturers give you some key, uh, key, key characteristics uh, from the design point of view, but the supplier should also identify some uh, critical characteristics um based on on their experience something that they can and they face on their knowledge they identify that's a critical so so make sure that you encourage that too next um 
if you look in the measurement system analysis, as um, Peter was describing, uh, we need to make sure that the process is capable, uh, the, the measurement system is capable of kind of an accepted percentage to tolerance ratio. If it is not, we need to make sure what containment or corrective plan is in place, right? At the guard body, uh, what are they actually they are doing, right? So making sure that you have a good MSA in place because that's critical, especially for SPC. Uh, making sure that you use attribute analysis, right? For when it's targeted, uh, but also make sure that when they create and they did the analysis, it was conducted with bad and good parts, right? Because otherwise you will know, hey, you can be very good at at passing good parts, but operators might have problems identifying the bad parts. So the study needs to include both the goods and the bad parts. In terms of the control plans, right, um, you make sure that, uh, uh, let's say, is, it needs to cover um, not only the non conforming tolerance features, right? It needs to say, hey, uh, when you are trending in the wrong direction, uh, what are you going to do about it, right? Making sure that your control plans account for all the high rates of process variation. It's not like, oh, that, that control plan only have one KC or whatever it is. You need to cover all the high risk based on your PFMEAs, right? Um, so making sure that the control plan addresses what the customer cases are, but also the self-selected cases, right? And the operator one is structure align with that control plan. So making sure that you everything is, is balanced in there, right? So next, uh, in terms of the um, um, SPC, right? Pin mentioned that it's very critical on this. So SPC is a live document and the operator needs to be trained on that and what to do 25 uh, trends on the SPC, right? So those SPC needs to be in the point of transformation. It's where the operation takes place. It's not that someone else does in an office, right? It needs to be live. It needs to be in the place where the transformation takes place. And the operator should know what to do and interpret those control charts and how to report that. It's not something that you collect, right? And then say it has a PIPAD submission. Right, that's no value added to to anyone. So make sure that the SPC is always at the point of transformation and people know what to do with that. Um, also, the the reference ma manual has some uh, general SPC resistance that is described in there. Like, uh, hey, what happens if um, I have multiple features? Do you want me to cover every feature? Uh, it describes that in the R material where you can go and look at the uh, some of the common questions for those general resistance such as uh, multiple features or not or things like um, my sample size is too small do I need to collect 30 points and things like that all the answers of those on those particular questions you might have are in the reference material you can refer to that as a as a, as a good source of information on how to answer and deal with those questions right so those are the red flags that we put together uh, obviously this is more than that we just took an example of that. Um, and if you encounter some situation that is not covering here, just let us know in, through LinkedIn or email. Say, hey, I'm in this issue. How do you will solve this issue if, uh, if uh, you were me? That kind of stuff, right? So we're more than happy to answer questions how they come. Um, next. I think it's over to you, Pete, just for the summary and close this. Yeah, thank you, Ricardo. So here we are, uh, we're at the close. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, we can show you what we've done for webinars so far this year and what we're looking at. We actually, our subject matter interest group team uh, at our next meeting will start brainstorming what we're gonna do in the next half of the year. Uh, it may not be as many webinars as, as we've done in the first half, but we'll certainly uh, have a few more. And we've got some ideas in the white space below seven, eight, and nine, looking at, you know, why is statistical control 
an important prerequisite to process capability. Why is that? You know, there's control, there's capability, there's centering, the three C's of SPC. And why is control so important as a prerequisite? That will definitely be running. Uh, eight, dealing with non-normal data. Yeah, we get that question a lot. And uh, we had a, uh, a webinar earlier that talked a little bit about that. I think we're gonna dive into that a little bit more. And, and then finally, you know, conducting capability studies for one-sided geometric tolerances. Uh, well, we had uh, webinar three dealt with unilateral tolerances. Uh, some of you may have been on that one with Andrew Stout and talked about true position. That was very highly received. We might decide to want to run that one again. Um, and so, because uh, again, that's that's something that is still, we get a lot of questions around true position, profiles, things like that. So that's where we're kind of heading. If you have specific topics you would like us to dig into and create some kind of webinar around, let us know. Either go to the community of practice site, process control methods on LinkedIn, or uh, you can certainly email any one of us and we'd be happy to uh, 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 take that into our meeting and dig into it. Uh, so uh, again, you can always look up what webinars are coming or forthcoming on the upcoming events page on the AESQ website. Next slide, I think we are now ready for some uh, questions and answers. You can use the chat function or just ask. Um, there was one question already. What's the difference between an assessment and an audit? An assessment is not as formal as an audit. An assessment doesn't lead to findings, but more about improvement opportunities. You know, here's what we saw, here's what we think you know, uh, let's talk about some possible improvement opportunities. And um, really that's what uh, is the big difference uh, as opposed to writing up official cars. Uh, that's not the point behind an assessment. So uh, hopefully uh, that answers that question. I saw that on the chat. Um, any other questions that we can entertain at this point. Okay, well, um, again, just to summarize, you, uh, you can obtain, a, you'll get an email from uh, SAE and it will uh, allow you to go ahead, it'll alert you when the material, this slide deck will be available as a PDF on the AESQ website and uh, also uh, the video. Oh, I see we have a question from Stephanie. Let's take a look at Ah, so if key characteristics are not defined on the print and the customer considers everything on the print a key characteristic, how should we proceed? Um, everything on the print a key characteristic, that's a, an, a, a, a you know, I go way back when I first started in this area, when I was a, you know, a manufacturing engineer, everyone will remember their very first program that they got involved with. And mine was the Boeing 777. It was on the air conditioning system. And what Boeing flowed down at that time was very uh, transformational. It was their advanced quality system D19000. And that drove a lot of the whole key characteristic control and theme in aerospace. 
Um, that was written in the late 80s, early 90s, and specifically for that program. And one slide I remember in that manual, it said, if, if a part has more than, you know, five or six key characteristics, it's probably a good candidate for a design review. If everything is considered key, one can almost argue nothing is considered key. So, you know, key characteristics have a very specific definition. They can affect form, fit, function, performance, service life, safety. Um, so I would have a, a big discussion around that. How does one weight, you know, the various features on a part? One way design does that is through their classification process. So, you know, when a design goes through a, a FAMICA, failure mode effects and criticality analysis, and one looks at, you know, the safety uh, aspect, you know, an oil path, a fuel path, where leaks could occur and cause a fire, now you start digging into the features that if they were not made to tolerance could contribute to those top level events. Now you're starting to get into the features that could be considered key or critical. And so um, if everything is considered key and equally weighted, that would be a very interesting design to look at. Um, so again, it, it, it would be, uh, I would have a good discussion around that. And I would also refer back to RM um, 13,004 and RM 13,145, APQP and PPAP that talks about, you know, how features become key characteristics uh, through a design FMEA analysis. But that begins right with the design analysis. That question points to that. Any other questions? Or, or uh, does any other SMIG team member have want to weigh in on that one? That looks like the only question we have right at the moment. Oh, here we go. So uh, is there a contact to send our query or uh, it, it found later? Sure. Um, we can, you can go on the LinkedIn process control method site. Just Google that. Go LinkedIn process control methods and you could ask the question there. I know Becky uh, reviews these sites and we do get questions that come in and then gets forwarded to the SMIG teams. So uh, that's one way to do it. Um, you can certainly email uh, any one of us on uh, the SMIG team uh, and we'd be happy to try to help answer your, your uh, question. Yeah. Uh, I think Becky already answered that. Thank you, Becky. Oh, any special approach for legacy parts that do not have PFMEA? Uh, again, you can, for legacy parts, you could look at from a, from a process standpoint, from a self-selection standpoint, what are those uh, operations they have uh, that are upstream, they have very big impact on downstream operations where your blueprint dimensions come into size. Could be roughing operations that could have some very good process key characteristics, rotating datums that make good process key characteristics, where scrap rework and repair have been prevalent. Um, those are always a good a uh, place to investigate whether or not you should be looking at driving process key characteristics. That can help a lot uh, by applying key characteristics in that manner. Um, again, that, again, that's just one opinion. 
I'll open it up for anyone else who may uh, want to weigh in on that one. The other thing, too, is to look at that legacy part. How often is it made? Is it done at a regular rate? You know, is it, is it you know, uh, run twice a year? Um, you know, there could be legacy components, like I said, that have a history of escapes, uh, quality notifications, non-conformances uh, that we still run a lot of, and we will be running a lot of in the future. That those could be great uh, applications of PFMEA. And um, so the answer to that would be perform the PFMEA on those types of parts. <clears throat> oh, and trust me, we do, we're involved with that all the time at Pratt internally. Uh, we have programs that were more or less designed in the 2000s that we're going back on right now in doing PFMEAs that were never done because that wasn't part of our culture back at that point. And you gotta remember, you know, a lot of this really came about over the last maybe five to seven years and really coming on board now because of the AESQ, you know, uh, uh, organization driving it collectively. So, um, so again, we're still, as an industry, folks, we're still new at this. You know, not like the automotive industry. We're still new at it, but we're getting there, and we're getting there, I think, quickly. Hopefully, these webinars are helping. Okay, so uh, I think that's it at the at this point. We're going to close it out. I want to thank everybody for being on. And um, well, we had a very good crowd. I saw about up to eighty six at one point. Uh, we want to thank you on behalf of the subject matter interest group for process control methods in the AESQ and SAE. Thank you all. And again, please keep looking at our website and keep uh, signing on to those webinars and flow them down into your organizations and keep the questions coming. Uh, together, we're gonna get a lot better at this stuff as, as we get more and more hands-on experience. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of the day, everyone.